Good morning, good afternoon, depending on your location. My name is Jason Sedovia, and I've got the pleasure of being the host and presenter today uh, for our, our webcast on managing contracts with Maximo. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend today's webcast. I truly hope you find the content both informative and valuable to your organization. For those of you who are new to OnTrack's Maximo webcast series, we offer one educational webcast each month on a topic of interest typically suggested by our clients. The purpose is simply to provide some insight into the capabilities of Maximo, sometimes as a very specific function or perhaps a broader topic like today. If you have any suggestions for future webcasts, please feel free to email them to me. I'll provide my contact information at the end of the presentation. We'll be muting the phone lines throughout the presentation. However, I will open them up at the end of the webcast to allow for any questions you may have. With that, we'll get started. So today's topic is on managing contracts within Maximo. Uh, what we're going to do is discuss kind of an overview of contracts, working with them within Maximo, go through some of the screens and the types, talk about terms and conditions, do a demonstration of one use case that can be executed in two different manners, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So I think everyone kind of understands what a contract is in terms of, you know, it, it's obviously it's an agreement between two parties um, that we obviously are going to be doing something in return, so whether it's for services or materials. The contracts module, module in Maximo manages the price payment schedules, service level agreements, terms and conditions associated with the contract and any following revisions. Um, the different types of contracts that Maximo does manage are purchase, blanket, or price, bundled under the purchase agreement type, lease and rental uh, contracts, labor rate contracts, and warranty contracts. If we kind of look at the uh, overall process of a contract, um, the two sections at the end that we've highlighted in green is really where Maximo focuses on. So we're not going to be discussing or Maximo doesn't manage you know, the draft of the agreement, um, how it gets sent to the vendor, sending it back and forth with red lines and edits and all that kind of information. Really where Maximo comes into play is once that contract is agreed, uh, let's say you've, you've got a supplier agreement to supply your warehouse. Uh, once you agree the pricing and the structure and, and service levels, that'll all get entered into Maximo and we would execute it and manage the, the contract through Maximo. We also have the ability to handle the, uh, the payment side of the things through invoicing. Um, so in terms of the purchase order, the receipt, and the invoice can all be managed in Maximo and then that can be bundled, three-way matched and bundled up for payment with the vendor. So. The different types of applications that are related to the contracts module, the first one being master contract. So this is a way for if you have uh, a contract with a vendor um, that's providing multiple services, maybe at different sites or different types of services that you want to have a discrete contract for, we can define that relationship, identify the, the parent-child uh, hierarchy with that, with that master contract link. Purchase contracts. So now these are detailed items and services at specific terms. So as I referred to in the, the um, uh, blanket or the agreement for uh, replenishing parts at a certain agreed price for the, uh, a given period of time, we can also do it for services. So if you're working with a maximal service provider and you have agreed rates for a particular period of time, you can do it for services as well. You can also do it for uh, blanket type agreements where maybe you're purchasing chemicals for a facility on a monthly basis and you want to do releases against that uh, over the course of a year and the uh, amounts uh, change over time, um, that can be managed as well. Labor rate contracts, so other than uh, getting into some details specific to services, now we're talking about uh, we might have a site where our maintenance is contracted out and we have 20 or 30 tradespeople that are working on site, but we don't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily employees. So this is where we can manage that rate schedule with a vendor, identify who the people are that are actually on site, uh, what their skill level is, uh, and identify any terms and conditions associated with that. Lease and rental contracts. So these are around uh, rotating assets. So this is the idea of uh, you might have a fleet of vehicles that you lease from a local uh, manufacturer. Uh, you can manage those leases, identify what those payments are, and actually generate the, the lease invoices to track the cost as it goes through the life cycle. And the same is true for rental agreements. Maybe you're renting 
um, some assets for some construction at your facility um, and you're paying like a monthly or a daily rental or whatever it may be, um, you can manage those rental contracts as well. And then the last one within Maxima will be around warranty contracts. So this is the idea, maybe you've done some construction work at your facility and you've implemented a new unit um, and you want to manage those assets. What can happen is, is we can identify what those new assets are and a warranty period so that whenever a work order is generated against that asset, the user's uh, notified with a dialog box that pops up and basically says, uh, this asset's under warranty, do you want to proceed? So you have the opportunity where you can contact the vendor, have them maintain the asset for you um, during that warranty period, or maybe you want to go ahead and execute the work and then do a chargeback or something for the cost that you incurred for doing the work yourself. Depending on how the agreement's set up, you have the ability to manage those types of contracts. When we would use a Maximo contract, so labor rate agreements for outsourced trades, I think we discussed that. Uh, master services agreement, so maybe uh, going away from the trades aspect, but maybe some professional services for IT consulting or business consulting, whatever it may be, environmental services. Uh, pricing agreements for inventory items, so let's say you've done some analysis on your spend in your warehouse and you've identified you're buying things from multiple vendors and you want to consolidate all that. Um, you obviously have the data within Maximo to you know, negotiate with the vendors and then say, you know, maybe I'm going to procure all my MRO inventory from Acklands Granger and we're going to agree set prices for the year. And based on previous usage and prices, you've got that information to negotiate the terms for you. Um, and then what happens is, is whenever your inventory reorders are triggered, they're going to be triggered at that agreed contract price. So the users aren't necessarily going out for bids each particular time. Fleet leases we mentioned, rental equipment we talked about, uh, new construction. So we do have the facility to create payment schedules. So if you're you know, just looking to, uh, like I said, build a new unit or build a new building or whatever it may be, um, you can have a contract that has uh, payment schedules tied to you know, when it's awarded, when its POs are released, when it's uh, completed, and when it's invoiced. So you have the ability to build out some sort of milestone payment schedule. Uh, managing stock chemicals and additives. So maybe you have you know, a truck come monthly. Um, and they drop off you know, 100,000 gallons, and sometimes it's 90,000, sometimes it's 105,000, you're going to accept it all. So you've got the ability to kind of say, well, this is the unit price we pay. This is the maximum amount over the course of the year, so we're not having to rewrite a new PO every time. The vendor has that one contract that they're referencing on drop-off every, every month. So when we go to build a contract, the tabs across the top are going to be fairly consistent. There is going to be some nuances, but essentially the first tab you're going to see is, is our header information. This is fairly consistent across the different types of contracts. You'll give it a description. You'll have a unique identifier. The type of contract will be identified. It's statusable. Um, we'll have details around uh, what the start date is, what the end date is. So when we go to release a PO, if it's not within that date range, you're not allowed to do it. We can also identify a renewal date. What that can do is we can set up an email notification, you know, maybe the month before that says, um, you know, this contract's about to expire. You know, you might want to renegotiate with the vendor. Company information. So once we identify the company that uh, this particular contract's with, it'll populate its address, any sort of shipping terms, um, freight terms that you guys have associated with that uh, company all come across. Something specific to uh, lease and rental contracts at the bottom of the screen there, this is where we get into now, um, if it's a lease, you know, is it a 36-month lease? Uh, how many payments are we making? Um, how is it factored into the, uh, the payment arrangements are all there. The Properties tab, now this will vary by application, um, but this essentially uh, kind of sets the rules that govern what you can do with this contract once it's approved. So for a purchase type contract, for example, um, you know, we always need a PO. Um, it's, it's checked by default and it's read only. But what we can do is we can either create release, release POs. So from the contract, we can create a release PO. Maybe it's auto approved. We don't have to go through the, pro, uh, the process of approving it each time. Um, or maybe you just want to reference a contract on POs when you create them um, through your, the normal course of your supply chain processes. So it has some flexibility and options there. The ability to exceed the amount. So do you want to allow them to you know, exceed that maximum amount or not? 
is there a payment schedule associated? So are we going to just have lines that we pay against, or are we going to establish a schedule of how we pay that? Adding lines on use. So let's say you have a services agreement um, for mechanical or electrical services. You might want to let them add lines because maybe they charge um, you know, shop supplies or some sort of overhead fee associated to their services. So if we allow them to add lines, then we can add those on individual release POs. Things around extended peer extensions and acceptance and notification periods, these are really just uh, uh, dates that allow us to send off email um, notifications. Can we extend it? Who should we contact? All that type of information. The contract lines themselves, these will vary a little bit from, from uh, application to application. Um, on a purchase application, uh, the line types are going to be very similar to what you see on a purchase order. So you'll identify a line, the line type, it's the same as your purchase order option. So you have items, materials, standard services, or services. You'll identify what the quantity, order units, unit costs are associated to them. But what's interesting also now is we identify there's uh, properties associated with each of the lines. So can we change the quantity on use, or can we change the price on use? Um, whether these are checked will govern, obviously, when a release PO is created, what you can actually do to the particular line item on the PO level. Uh, if we're talking about contract lines for labor rate contracts, then we're identifying um, you know, what is the craft, what is the skill, uh, what is the rate associated with it. So a little bit of a different table, and we'll show that in the demonstration. So specific to labor and assets, after we go through the adding the contract lines uh, for rental or lease contracts, you'll want to associate, or warranty contracts, sorry, you'll want to associate assets to those. So what assets are governed by this particular lease contract or this particular warranty contract? So it gives you that information. Um, what you have then have for labor is now we're going to assign certain individuals. So on the previous tab, we've associated uh, specific crafts and skill levels to the contract. Now we're giving it a de um, labor names. So those people that are going to be on site performing the work, um, if they're labor, we can actually assign them work orders. They can enter their time against work orders, and all that information gets captured. So here's where we build uh, the people associated with a particular labor rate contract now. And we'll show that uh, in the demonstration as well. The final piece around contracts is the terms and conditions. So these are just a library, um, and, and there's arrangements, provisions, rules that you guys have agreed to when you meet, when you uh, uh, agree the contract with your your vendor. So as I mentioned earlier, we're not necessarily you know redlining these and editing them and sending them back and forth, but maybe you as a company have a standard library of terms and conditions. You'll notice on the right hand side of the screen, there's just some examples um, that you know for your default position on warranties is, is this clause, and that's what your legal team's agreed to. And so you can select it and associate it to this contract. If in that process of the contract review pro, um, that with the vendor that you guys have identified, you're going to make special exceptions or remove clauses, we can come in here and edit these terms and conditions, and then when we save it, that'll be, and uh, once we save and approve the contract, then that forms the agreement in place uh, with this particular vendor that will govern these terms. Any release POs will consume these, um, these same uh, contract terms and conditions. And when you print the purchase order or save it as a PDF to send to the vendor, those uh, terms and conditions will be shown on kind of the page two of the purchase order that you send out with them. So, now I'm just going to jump into the application. And what we're going to do is, much like at Maximo, there's kind of different ways to, to skin a cat. So the use case that I'm going to demonstrate is just building a, a contract with a vendor that provides trade services. But I'm going to do it two different ways. So the first way I'm going to do it is with a labor rate contract. Some of the advantages of this uh, is you're going to have the named resource so that if these people are contracted services and they're essentially at your facility, um, you know, 40 hours a week or whatever it may be, um, then you want to have them as labor in your system because your schedule, your schedulers and planners are able to assign work orders to them. They're going to go into Maximo, enter their time on the work order itself. 
Um, and it's going to track that information. So if you have certain qualifications and skill level requirements and you need to know when specific things were done, this helps with that granularity, being able to identify that information. Um, you also have the ability to approve time. So as a contractor, you know, by default in Maximo, their time is unapproved. So now we have you know, uh, the ability for your supervisor or planner scheduler to come in and approve that information. What you can then do is also uh, prepare your own invoices. So if you have a contract for agreed rates and people are putting their time against your work orders, we could at the end of the month select all the uh, labor entries for a particular vendor for a particular time period and generate our own invoice and then send that off to payment. So it's kind of it helps uh, simplify the process and remove a lot of manual steps and also with some of the reconciliation. So if they send you an invoice and there's a variance, it's kind of on them then to justify that because your invoice is built off of time injured against work orders. Some people might see there's a little bit more involved in setting up the contract. Um, so that's a consideration that you'll want to think about. Uh, depending on, too, if you have you know dozens and dozens of people at the facility at different rates and if you have different premium rates based on call-out times and things like that, sometimes you might see it's a little bit harder to set up. And now that you have a labor rate contract, so all those good things I said is you actually have to have someone entering their time then. So whether they're doing it individually or they're recording it on a sheet of paper and you have an admin or a supervisor recording that back onto the work order, that needs to happen in order for their time to get charged. The other option I'll show is purchase contracts. So it might be a little bit more straightforward in terms of the setup. We can create release POs and charge against the work orders. I can have a maximum amount for a particular year, um, and it can track the release costs over time, what my committed and uncommitted costs are. So it's actually quite a nice simplified setup. Um, one of the considerations you'll want to think about, because we're doing POs now for, uh, that we're charging to work orders, we need to make sure that we're receiving those services. And we'll show this in the, the demonstration, but someone's going to have to go in and receive those services. We lose a little bit of visibility on who did the work. So now I don't know that it was Jason Sadovi that did the work. I just know the vendor, and they had someone here providing services for a period of time. We can track that through notes and things like that. But it, as, you, as you'll see, it's maybe not quite as, um, as clear-cut as the library option. OK, so what I'm going to do first now I'm going to go to work order tracking and just create a work order for uh, some work that we need to get done. So I'm going to select a particular asset that uh, this work is going to be required to do. And I'm going to grab a job plan um, just for a, an annual uh, pump service. That'll pop up here in a second. I'm also going to go ahead and fill out my GL account just so we don't have any issues with charges later. OK, so we'll notice the work order is in a waiting approval status. We have a, you know, a, an annual pump service against this asset. When I click on the Plans tab, because I associated a job plan to it, um, I have specific tasks that need to be done, and I have uh, specific labor. Um, uh, I have a mechanic and an electrician required to execute this work. So that information um, is all kind of on the work order. So I'm going to go ahead and approve this work order now just so we know it's in an approved status. And I'm now going to go and create a labor rate contract. Click New. And I'm going to call this, so our contract number is 1047. I'll just write that down for later use. And this is an annual service agreement. And maybe what I'll do is I'll say the start date was the 1st of May. And for annual, we'll just say it's for next year. And I'm going to say. Um, the renewal date is uh, April 1st of next year. So like I mentioned, I can kind of send myself a reminder a month before it actually ends. I'm going to associate a vendor to this particular labor rate contract now. And I'm going to add uh, two crafts. So I'm going to add an electrical craft. And I'm just going to say the rate is $75. And I'm going to add a mechanical craft. So I'm going to add a mechanical craft. And I'm going to say maybe their rate is $65. One of the other nice things about contracts, so as you can see, if we have you know, mill rights and general laborers and carpenters, and then we have journeymen first year, second year, you can see how this rate table could actually be quite extensive. So what, 
what thing um, that Maxim allows you to do is allow price adjustments. So let's say if you do renegotiate this next year and you just want to say it's a 5% across the board rate, you'd select what ones are applicable, click the apply, and it just kind of shows you what the new rate is, and then you can apply that rate. So it's just a nice little way uh, for renewing contracts over time that, uh, that can be helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and approve this, uh, this contract now. So I'll take it from a draft status to an approved status. You'll notice I have revision zero here. So again, over time, once I approve the record, we can't necessarily add new rate schedules to it um, or terms and conditions. But we could revise the contract if we jointly agree and, and Maxim will track that information for us. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate specific labor to this contract now. So I'm going to add John Hunter as an electrician. And I'm going to add Tom Revis as a mechanic. What happens now is you'll notice once I identify these people, because uh, they were previously in the system, it's established what their premium pay rates are. So if this person's working more than eight hours per shift, it's time and a half. If they're working on Sundays, maybe it's two times. Holiday hours are three times. So we can track a lot of information on the particular contract. So I'm going to go back to my work order now. So we would assume that that particular you know, labor rate contract was, was done by our procurement folks, and that was kind of in place. But now I'm a planner. I've got this pump service that needs to happen for my annual overhaul. Um, because these guys are on site every day, and I need to you know, make sure they're doing work, I can come in here on, on the Assignments tab and actually enter their information. So if I just expand this and I put uh, Hunter in here, it knows it's an, electri uh, um, an electrician. Uh, the vendor, he's on a couple different contracts, so I'll just you know, change that to the current one. Um, and then I can give him a start date. Um, oh, actually, sorry, I should have put in. Rebus on that one, so I'll put him on this one now. So again, same thing. It shows the reference to the vendor and the contract. Uh, the planned hours, obviously, are coming from the job plan. So I can go ahead now, and as soon as I click Save, you'll notice this status on the assignment goes to Assigned. And th th this will obviously vary depending on how you guys plan and execute work, whether you're using Scheduler, Assignment Manager, if you're putting things in a job jar, whatever. But again, just for, for demonstration purposes now, I've assigned this particular work order to these two individuals. And let's say they are Maximo users. So if I go to Labor Reporting, they have the ability now to come in and just enter their time by work order. So maybe the end of the day they come in and say, uh, I was working on work order uh, 1210. Come in here. Um, I'm just going to say four hours, just because the, if I put the 40 hours on here, because today's date is, you know, I, I can't put it out into the future, so I'm just going to say four hours for, uh, for now. And then Revis as well. And we've got that information. I'll have him for four hours as well. So I save that. Now I notice uh, there's a f um, if I grab the work orders uh, 1210 that I was just working on, you'll notice that the, the labor checkbox here is unapproved. So they've just entered their time. So what's nice is you have a step here where someone in your organization can come in and approve it. So whether you know you, you want to say, well, you weren't really here four hours or whatever it may be, but you can come in and approve that time for them. Um, it's just saying I had a, a $0 on the cost of this contract, so it's just giving me a warning. But I'm going to go ahead and click OK, saying, yeah, I'm OK to exceed it. And what's going to happen is those two records are now going to be approved. What I can then do is I can grab those two records for work order 1210, and I can go ahead and create my own invoice. So invoice 1072. I can say OK. And then if I go to the invoice application, and I look up invoice 1072, it's gone ahead and created an invoice for me automatically. It has the company information from the contract. It's in an approved status because the, the labor entries were approved. Uh, the invoice lines, 
were those two individuals for the four hours. If I open up the line, you can even see the detail um, around what work order they did charge to. So all that information is there. Obviously, you're not going to do it on a work order by work order basis, but you could run it for you know for a particular month and a particular contract, and then you'd have all these lines here, and the invoice is already approved. So when their invoice comes in, if they don't match, like I said, the burden's kind of on them to explain, you know, what that uh, what that variance is or why you should be paying it. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to work order tracking, and I'll jump back to our work order 1210. And when I look on the actuals tab, um, you'll notice I have those labor entries here now. So they entered it in labor reporting. Maybe that's the only application they have access to as contractors. But that information is coming back to the work order for me. So I have my plans. I have my actuals. I can do all my analysis at the work order level. So that's how we would do it if we wanted to do labor rate contracts. The second scenario I want to talk about is the exact same use case, but we're going to maybe uh, simplify it a little bit uh, with a purchase contract. So I'm just going to create a new work order. 1211, and I'm going to use the same asset, and I'm going to use the same job plan as well. And again, I'll just define the GL account so it doesn't cause us problems. And when I click on the plans, you'll notice everything's just like the previous work order we saw. So I'm going to go ahead and approve this work order. So same scenario, I've got a work order, I need work to do, we're just going to do it differently now. So rather than a labor rate contract, I'm going to go ahead and create a purchase contract. So I'm going to create purchase contract 1048, and we'll call it an annual service agreement as well. Um, you know, I can give it kind of the same, oops, the same parameters. I'm going to do it with the same vendor even, just to kind of show some consistency. On the properties here, I'm going to say we want to create releases. And I'll, I'll show you as kind of why I'm doing this in this particular use case. But So for contract lines now, what I'm going to say is uh, line one is just going to be a service. So I can free text, much like a purchase order. And I'll say electrical. And for one hour we pay $75. But what I'm going to allow them to do is on the releases, they can change the quantity. So we can it's not always going to be in one hour increments. It'll be whatever a particular job is for. So I'm going to add another row of service. Call it mechanical. For one hour, the unit cost is 65. And I'm going to allow the change quantity. I'll just save this. Some similar things apply again. So we can apply um, apply price adjustments if we want to. We have terms and conditions associated um, you know, with the contract. I can say there's this canceling, inspection, shipping, whatever. Um, but the terms and conditions are all the same across contracts. But what I'm going to do now, there's a subtle step with uh, purchase contracts. I need to authorize it for a particular site. So purchase contracts are just a you know, at the site level, so I have to need to identify what sites can use this. So I'll just select the one I'm in right now. I'll say OK, and then I'm going to go ahead and approve this contract. OK, so now what I can do, I've got this approved contract. I can come onto my actions here, and I can create a release PO. So I'm just going to auto number it, and it's going to give me PO 1100. And it's for this vendor. I'm going to say I want both these these contract lines, but in this case now, you know, I'm going to want four hours of each of them instead of one. So I have the ability to change my quantities, and I'm going to charge work order 1211 was that new work order I created. So it tells me the location asset and GL account associated with that. So when I select OK now, it's going to create a purchase order for me. What's nice about purchase contracts, I can review my release cost. And what this is going to do for me now is it's going to give me some relevant information. I can see my total cost to date is zero. Um, I have one uncommitted release um, for the amount of $560. It's uncommitted because this particular PO is in a waiting approval status. 
um, what I've received, what I have uh, amount remaining, and what's been invoiced. So I can track all that information, which is uh, helpful. One thing I didn't talk about was the ability for um, purchase contracts. I could create like a maximum amount and a maximum release amount. So because I didn't define it, it's essentially uh, infinite or unlimited right now. But let's say I had a million dollars for the year and that we're going to approve that we're going to do business with CMC. But because my planners are going to be issuing these releases over time, maybe I don't want any particular re release to be over 25000 or something like that. So it's a way to kind of just manage the spend over the course of time. So when I view my release costs again, I'm going to go to this purchase order, and I'm just going to approve it. Um, we can set this up so that you know release POs are automatically approved, but in the system it's just using base functionality right now, so I, I just have this extra step of going in and approving it. But when I jump back to the contract, if I view my release costs, you'll now notice instead of being uncommitted, it's a committed release, and the committed cost is, is the amount, because we've got an approved uh, purchase order. This is an external commitment with a the vendor. They can go ahead and provide those services now. So what happens is your planner might have the ability to create that release and then send you know, PO 1100 out to CMC and say, come do this work on work order 1200 for us. Um, but what will happen is, is rather than entering time now, we're going to have to receive those services. So I'm going to go to the receiving application. I'm going to go to my PO 1100. And I'm going to select service receipts and select my ordered services. And it's going to see here, well, my approved PO was for four hours for each. I can put some marks in here, remarks in here if I want to say, you know, Dave did the work. So here's where you can have some ability to have some, um, you know, a little bit more detail. But right now we're just saying the line was mechanical. They were, uh, we, we issued a PO for four. You know, I'm going to receive four. I'll just take the, the easy route or the happy route right now. Um, so we have these two. You'll notice my receipts are none right now. My PO is approved. So as soon as I click Saved, my PO stays approved. My receipts go to complete. If I go back to my contract, and I look at my release costs again, um, you'll notice I have you know amount received of 560. My amount remaining, because my total cost was zero, if I had a million dollars in there, obviously it would just decrement that down. So again, it's a nice way to kind of track what you've spent ongoing with this particular vendor, um, and it has all that information for you. If I go to the work order, 1211, and I go on to my actuals, um, you'll notice there's no labor entries because we didn't have anybody doing work on this from a labor perspective. But when I click on the services tab, because I received those services, they do show up here. And I can expand it. It shows me um, you know, what the PO reference was, what the PO line was, the date it was received. Um, all that information is there for me. Um, any long description uh, information is all there. So we are keeping the costs associated to the work order. It might be a little bit easier because now it's all in the planner's hands. They're just sending a PO out. Someone does the work. That, that planner can receive the services, make sure that they actually did the work. Um, and then that information comes across. The final thing to kind of bring it on par with the other option was is we would have to come in here. Um, and rather than having a PO or an invoice created for us, we'd have to create a new invoice. But it's not that hard if we just reference the approved PO that we had. As soon as I enter that, it tells me what contract it's referencing, tells me the vendor. So all this information is populated for me. I can go to the invoice lines, and I can copy the PO lines. So what it's showing me is I have two lines, and they're both received. So I'm able to select both of them to invoice now. Um, if I expand one of them, you'll still see work order 1211. Let's scroll down a little bit there. So you'll still see all the charge information. 1211 is there. Uh, we know that that's the reference. Um, I can go ahead and you know uh, change the status or approve this invoice and then trigger it off for payment with my financial system. So a couple different ways. There, like I said, there's pros and cons to each option, but that's kind of a, a quick and dirty view of showing at least purchase and labor rate contracts associated to uh, um, how you might handle that particular aspect.
I'll just go back to uh, put my contact information back up here. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll conclude today's webcast. Uh, I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, I hope you found some value and in, in interest in the, uh, the webcast today. If you want a copy of the presented uh, PowerPoint, please feel free to send me an email um, and your contact information, and I'll be able to reply it. Um, I'm going to close both the teleconference line and the online meeting center. So again, thanks, and we'll be seeing you at our next webcast.